and we're ready to cover hemodialysis. So let's get started. Hemodialysis. Recently, I had covered um, peritoneal dialysis. Today, we are going to cover um, hemodialysis. So first off, let's talk about what we're going to be covering. We're going to cover the introduction, which we're going to be going over hemodialysis. Then the presentation, what does the def what it does, the definition of terms and the types of access. Then we're going to cover nursing care and the complications and priorities of that. And then the conclusion would be any comments or questions you would put in the section below. So who am I? I am Broda, the owner and one of the tutors here at one-on-one -on -one NCLEX tutoring. So I found a former dialysis patient and what he said about his time on dialysis. I had been living on dialysis for three years or so and a new kidney felt like a reprieve. It was a new gift on life and that's by Peter Wright. They are linked to that dialysis machine. They have to go frequently throughout the week and it is very defining in what they can and can't do. So number one, the introduction and the definitions. So like I said, previously we've talked about peritoneal dialysis. Today we're going to talk about hemodialysis and it works in place of the kidney to pull off waste products and the fluids off the body. But first, let's go over some definitions. Osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of fluid across the semi membrane from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. So here we have a lower concentration up here in the top right corner. We have lower concentration and then we have an area of higher concentration. And in the next picture, you see that the fluid moved to make the concentrations the same. Then we have diffusion, which is the movement of particles from one area of higher concentration to one of lower concentration. So here the fluid is the same in both compartments. Now it's the solute that moves to equalize the concentration. Next is ultrafiltration. It is the movement of fluid across the semipermeable membrane as a result of an artificially created pressure radiant. So this is similar to what we were talked about with peritoneal, peritoneal dialysis because the amount of glucose causes that pressure to do the ultrafiltration. They're using the machine to help with that pressure in hemodialysis. So what is the function of hemodialysis? It cleanses the blood of accumulated waste products and corrects electrolyte imbalances. Secondly, it removes urea, creatinine, and uric acid and the byproducts of protein metabolism. Third, it takes off extra fluids uh, it helps and maintains to restore the buffer system. The dialysis machine does all of these functions for the client instead of their kidney. It does the osmosis, the diff diffusion, and the ultrafiltration. So the presentation, explanation of the process and how it is so the access of how we get to the blood, and we have several accesses, and each has advantages and disadvantages as to why and when they would be used. So subcavian vein is used for short-term use of a temporary or temporary use for AKI. 
acute kidney injury, or femoral catheters, which are used to wait for sh shunt to be ready to use, which is approximately six weeks, and an external arterial venous shunt, which is a creation of the shunt outside. It's the loop that they make, only it's outside the body. There are there is tubing outside the body that is acting like the veins and the arteries, where with the internal arterial venous shunt, we have a creation of the shunt inside using the arteries and veins. So subclavian and femoral catheters, they're only for dialysis and should only be accessed by the dialysis personnel. They're gonna assess, and so are we, for hematoma, bleeding, catheter dislodgement and infection, and there should be an occlusive dressing over these at all times. Subclavian catheters usually are filled with heparin and capped, only uncapped for dialysis, and they may be left in place for up to six weeks with no complications. And notice that the catheter goes almost into the heart. So we are very close to the heart here. The femoral catheter, we're going to assess for circulation, temperature, and pulses. We're gonna do meticulous peritoneal care because of where that catheter is located, the site of the insertion. We're gonna use IV infusion pump or controller with micro drip of heparin if it's ordered. Um, and if the femoral vein is used, the client must not be sitting at more than 45 degrees because they can kink it or they can include the vein. The external arterial venous shunt has two scholastic cannulas that are surgically inserted into the artery and a vein. And they make the loop. Here's the loop, okay? Um, cannulas are connected to a U shape and the blood flows from the client's artery to a vein via the shunt. The tubing leading to the dialyser is connected to the artery cannula and the blood returning goes into the vein cannula. When finished, the cannulas are clamped and reattached. Um, this reforms that U shape. So the advantages versus the disadvantages. The advantages, they can be used immediately following its creation. And there is no vena puncture necessary for dialysis. Whereas the disadvantage is the disconnection or dislodgement can occur because it's an outside, outside the body. So we're at risk for hemorrhage, infection and clotting and there is a potential for skin erosion around the catheter site. So the care of the external arterial venous shunt, we need to avoid getting it wet, wrap a dressing completely around the shunt and keep clean and dry. We need to keep clamps at the bed sites in case they, for whatever reason, start to leak and are throwing out a lot of blood, I need to be able to clamp them. No BP, drawing of blood, or placing IVs or administering injections should happen on that extremity and the client needs to be taught this also. Need to monitor for hemorrhage, infection, and clotting and skin integrity around the site. And auscultate for a brute and palpate for a thrill. So next is an internal arterial venous shunt, the permanent access of choice for a client with chronic kidney disease. It's surgically created fistula by anastomosis of a large artery and a large vein in the arm. Flow from arterial engorges the vein and maturity takes four to six weeks. That's why the other two that we've talked about the um, subclavian and the femoral catheter are all good for six weeks. These, the internal arterial venous shunt, takes six weeks to mature. 
and it's required to mature before we can use it. The uses for internal arterial venous shunt are used for chronic dialysis, clients who do not have adequate blood vessels for creation of a fistula, the graft made of Gore-Tex or bovine cow carotid artery, and it involves anastomosis of an artery to a vein using an artificial graft. The extremity used for dialysis only is only used for that. There is no BP or needle sticks for IV or IM. Hand flexing exercises such as a ball squeezing will help promote the graft maturity. They need to note the temperature and the capillary refill of the extremity. You need to palpate pulses and monitor the hand for swelling. And then you need to monitor for clotting or complaints of tingling or discomfort in the extremity or inability to palpate a thrill or auscultate a bruit over the fistula. The care of the internal arterial venous shunt is you need to monitor for arterial still syndrome, too much blood is diverted to the vein and arterial perfusion to the hand is compromised. We need to monitor for infection, monitor for signs and symptoms of heart failure, and monitor for complications such as air embolism, disequilibrium syndrome, electrolyte imbalances, encephalopathy, hemorrhage, hepatitis, hypotension, sepsis, and shock. So now there were a couple of those that I wanna define, steel syndrome and disequilibrium syndrome. So steel syndrome, it is all about the access. The hand becomes ischemic because um, we've taken part of this circulation away from the hand itself. So they're gonna complain of numbness, pain, the hand's gonna be cool and it's gonna be weak. This can cause necrosis and loss of fingers or their hand. So it's imperative that we react quickly. And then disequilibrium syndrome is caused by rapid removal of solutes from the body during hemodialysis. The signs and symptoms may be manifested by no more than restlessness and a severe headache, which may occur during or soon after the hemodialysis. It is then followed by nausea and vomiting, often accompanied by a blood pressure elevation, may be accompanied by disorientation and tremors, seizures, and cardiac cath arrhythmias have been reported. So the priority for disequilibrium syndrome is to notify the MD. There is nothing as the RN that we can do or the LPN that we can do. We need to get a hold of the doctor. He needs to help us with getting the solutes back in that the patient lost. The things we can do but are not a priority are monitoring the client, elevating the head of the bed and assessing the fistula site. So complications of hemodialysis are air embolism, disequilibrium syndrome, electrolyte alterations, encephalopathy, hemorrhage, hepatitis, hypotension, sepsis, shock. So I wanted to go over priority of air embolism with you. It stop, you stop the dialysis, you turn the client on their left side with their head down. People need to know the reason for that. This is an air bubble and air bubbles go up. So if I put the head down and I put them on their left side, then the air bubble is gonna get trapped in the bottom part of the ventricle because it is up just like a swimming pool, the bubble's gonna go up. Notify the MD, um, not, notify rapid response, administer oxygen, assess vitals and pulse ox, and document the event. The advantages and disadvantages of an internal are risk for clotting and bleeding is low. The fistula can be in, used indefinitely and once healed, no external dressing is required. So an internal is better in the fact that you 
have less risk factors. But the disadvantages are that the fistula cannot be used immediately, that you have to wait for it to mature up to six weeks. The needle insertion through the skin and the tissues to the fistula are required for doing dialysis. Infiltrations during dialysis can happen and they can cause hematoma. Aneurysms can form on the fistula and heart failure can occur from that increased blood flow in the venous system. So this is a patient on a dialysis machine, um, just to give you an actual picture of a live person. And this is it for today. I hope this has helped you in learning about hemodialysis. If you have any questions about hemodialysis, please leave them in the comments below. If you have any other questions, you can email me at rotasummer at one-on-one and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.